So uh, let me start by posing this uh, simple or rather uh, naive question, which is now the, the title of my talk. Uh, what do we mean when we refer to Israel as the Jewish state? Um, what does the designation Jewish amount to in the context of this sovereign nation state? What does it mean for the politics of the state to be identified as Jewish? And how does all of this reflect upon the wider politics of the Middle East? Our public discourse is rife with such references to Israel as the Jewish state. Especially in the English world, the two terms, the state of Israel and the Jewish state, are taken to be freely interchangeable uh, synonyms of each other. Yet I would argue that the meaning of this designation is far from being clear. On the contrary, it is so vague as to encourage misunderstanding, miscommunication, and ultimately conflict. Israelis, Jewish people, Zionists of various ideological persuasions, and others participating in this discourse hold diverging, often conflicting understandings of what it means for Israel to be a Jewish state. The concept, in other words, is used to designate contesting political worldviews that, simply put, cannot stomach each other. The conflict over what it means for the state of Israel to be Jewish, and especially over the political implications of this designation, has been a staple of Israeli politics. It sometimes goes unnoticed in the world outside of Israel when observers simply project on Israel or onto Israel their understanding of the basic concepts of nationalism, religion, ethnicity, and identity, identity more generally. By doing so, these observers miss what I would argue is a core constitutive element of the Israeli polity. The state of Israel, the society it has built, and the culture it perpetuates are all determined by what I would call an unresolved Jewish identity problem, or even an identity crisis that underlies the reality of Israel and by implication that of the Middle East at large. So if you want to understand Israel, in other words, you must first grasp the problem of Jewish identity in this polity. And while I will not pretend to have a solution to this problem, I hope to outline tonight the basic features of this problem and thus hopefully enable a somewhat clearer view of what is at stake here. I would like to suggest to you that there are primarily two distinct, contesting, and even contradictory political projects or horizons that are often entangled and confused in the discourse on Israeli politics, on Jewish politics, and on the interplay between these terms, that is, Israeli politics as or versus Jewish politics. It seems to me that many of us, students of the Middle East and especially of the Israeli case, participants in Jewish and Israeli politics, people representing various groups and points of views in related debates, and so many more, we often bear in mind a usually amorphous, sometimes inconsistent, sense of a core meaning related to these terms that is quite strikingly different from that held by our, by our interlocutors, without this difference being explicitly acknowledged. So it might be worth to try and spell out some of the assumptions hidden behind uh, our daily discourse and our daily use of these terms and some of their implications. So we may begin this, ex begin this exercise, I'm sorry, by drawing a rather trivial distinction between two closely related but not indistinct English words, both of which would usually be translated into Hebrew as Yehudi, the same word, Yehudi, Jew and Jewish. I find the two contesting political outlooks or meanings to be encapsulated in a certain distinction we sometimes employ when we use those English terms. Now, but before I discuss this matter, I must clarify that the following is, uh, obviously does not pretend to be an exhaustive exploration of these terms. My concern here is primarily and only with a certain prevalent, I think common use of the terms in a more specific context of politics. So, what do we mean by Jew versus Jewish? The former word 
Jew, would be read in the context of the distinction I have in mind as a noun, a name. It alludes to one, one's being, a Jew. This, almost by definition, would suggest that the matter at hand, that is, this being, one's being a Jew, is a derivative, derivative of some so-called objective criteria. More often than not, probably having to do with one's so-called natural or biological ancestry or accident of birth. Many would prefer to call it ethnicity, a term which they find to be clearer or less offensive. This name refers to some allegedly objective measure and ought to be simple definition that would mark one as either a Jew or not a Jew. This measure may be only remotely, and sometimes not at all, dependent on the choice, preference, or behaviors, actions, ethics, outlooks, and so on of the individual. Paradigmatically, and again, in the context of this narrow meaning I am focusing on here, and only in this context, Paradigmatically, one is born a Jew. Needless to say, one can also become a Jew, but this too would suggest the working in the background of these uh, uh, objective criteria, a line of demarcation that uh, the non-Jew has to cross in order to become, i.e., to now come and be a Jew. Note also that this being is by definition singular and it has to do with a person. It cannot refer to ideas, to objects, to collectives, and to other non-persons. They cannot be Jews. Only a person can pass the essential criteria, criterion I'm sorry, to have the essence that would make one a Jew. Obviously, we can also identify a relevant group identity here, that of Jews in the plurality, but this would not necessarily amount to much more than many persons, each being a Jew individually. The word Jewish, on the other hand, an adjective that can also be inflicted to be an adverb, that is, when we mark a certain act, for example, as being done Jewishly, it suggests a quality, a style, a content, and only remotely, if ever, a being. While it, too, might be seen as ultimately referring to a certain essence, it is of a different order from the existential matter of being or not being a Jew. In the usage I have in mind, Jewish is explicitly subjective, evaluative, judgmental even, as it designates certain things, people, ideas, ethics, law, philosophy, and so on, as corresponding positively to a certain quality. The exact nature of this quality is obviously a matter of interpretation and judgment and given to debate and negotiation. In other words, it has to do with some sense of tradition, which is an argument extended through time regarding practice, meaning, collective boundaries, and so forth. Now, in a narrower sense, Jewish may simply be the adjective inflicted from Jew, meaning that it only designates that which is of a Jew. In this case, one's being a Jew would be the quality which allows for one's actions, beliefs, ideas, and so on to be, so on to be designated Jewish. Here, Jewish would simply mean belongs to a Jew or Jews, held by a Jew or Jews, um, practiced by a Jew or Jews, and, and so forth. It is the subject or the agent, Jew, Jews, doing, owning, holding the object that renders the latter Jewish. In the, cost, in the context of this usage, mind you, there is practically no limit to what this marker may contain, as anything by, done by Jews or belonging to Jews could be considered Jewish. Now, needless to say, this narrow meaning of the adjective Jewish misses much of what we often refer to when we identify something as Jewish. Well, there are obviously many instances when Jewish is used exactly to allude to this narrow sense, including, I would hasten to mention here and 
discuss in more details later, in instances when we refer to the Jewish state and to Jewish politics, I nevertheless think it can be convincingly argue, argued that more often than not, we use Jewish to refer to a quality, quality, I'm sorry, that is of a historical, sociocultural, or traditional nature. And it is this usage I want to stress in the context of the duality of Jew versus Jewish. This usage of the term would suggest that there is some correspondence of meaning and not just attribution that justifies or demands that we identify something as Jewish. As such, it necessarily involves evaluation and judgment. It alludes to a clearly evasive, contested, and negotiated sense of authenticity. These two usages, the narrow one by which Jewish means of a Jew, and the more expensive one, where it refers to a constructed and negotiated quality, they are not necessarily mutually exclusive. One could argue, for example, that it is the mere fact that a certain attitude has been prevalent among people who are Jews <coughs> that ultimately constitutes it or constructs it as a Jewish attitude. But these two usages are also not necessarily mutually dependent. For something to be Jewish, in the more expensive sense of the term, it does not have to be of a Jew or of Jews. Moreover, even if we insist on the validity of the notion of a Jew as having to do with some essence of being, we may conclude that non-Jews may be holding ideas that are Jewish, uh, adhere to Jewish values, observe Jewish practices, and so on. Similarly, and again, maybe more judgmentally, we may also conclude that people who are Jews do not adhere to Jewish values, to ideas, practices, etc., that are Jewish. In other words, both the notions of uh, Jewish non-Jews and that of non-Jewish Jews would make sense in the context of this usage of the term. Now, as I already noted, this all may, and I hope, be trivial, or rather trivial, but I suspect that some of the more problematic political consequences of these two contesting understandings often go unnoticed, as a certain problematic reading of them uh, has become a taken-for-granted assumption of many discussions on such notions as Jewish politics, and um, Jewish collectivity, and especially on Zionist nationalism and Israeli nation statehood. Applied to politics, or more specifically to nationalism and nation statehood, which is obviously my focus here, the distinction between Jew and Jewish ultimately holds, or either maybe hides and confuses, two, at least two, very different and often conflicting ideas, outlooks, or programs. So let us focus at this point on the nation state and spell out the basic differences between a Jewish state and a Jew's state. The notion of a Jew's state, or the state of the Jews, Medinat HaYehudim in Hebrew, would seem to be suggesting a simple, direct application of the so-called objective criteria of the individual's biological origin or descent and the collective identity built upon it, to the basic logic of the politics of nation statehood and of sovereignty. A sovereign nation state of Jews would simply be defined or constituted by the objective fact of the biological, ethnic, racial, national, etc., makeup of the subjects represented in its sovereignty. If we follow the main political fiction of modern sovereignty, according to which the popular national will constitutes itself as sovereign via the nation state, then we can describe the Jews state as the sovereign who is constituted by or on the collective will of the Jews. Seemingly, the logic here is quite straightforward. A Jews state would be the simple, almost direct equivalent of the state of the French, or of the German, or the Serbs, and so on. Now, looked at from a normatively concerned point of view, 
the notion of a Jewish state would seem to be quite neutral, as, at least in principle, there is no normative or ethical directive immediately and explicitly imposed on such a state. Once the godlike event of self-creation of modern sovereignty, of Jews in this case, has taken place, the sovereign and its politics do not have to abide by any normative principles, Jewish or otherwise, to be authentically exercising their constitutive reason. The Jews, and let us suspend for now the question of what this designation may mean, they can, or rather they should, make of their state whatever they choose to. They can, of course, prefer a certain type of uh, contract, social contract, to guide their state politics. Let's say a Republican ethos versus a liberal one, for example. But there is no outside perspective that would normatively judge the authenticity, the ethics, or the purpose of these politics. All that is required is that the collective body present or represented at the core of the fiction of the popular will that allegedly constitutes the sovereign is identified as a group of Jews. Note that this conceptualization of the Jewish state as a state of Jews, uh, or you know, a state of Jews, I'm sorry, assumes as given and as obvious matters that are in effect highly contested and uh, are far from being clear. Specifically, arguments for Israel's being simply and only the Jewish state and not, that is, a Jewish state, fail, or maybe they prefer not to, seriously reflect upon the problematic application of a modern, European, Christian in origin, categories of nation, state, ethos, race, religion, etc., to the case of Jews or to the Jewish case. Probably the most obvious aspect of this neglect is the, in effect, highly uh, contested matter of the alleged objective criteria that would determine who counts as a Jew and who does not. I will address this issue in more details later on. <clears throat> the notion of a Jewish state, on the other hand, would suggest, at least in the framework of the distinction I, have, uh, I outlined uh, earlier, it would suggest some normative, ethical, and constitutive worldview as determining the state's identity or its constitution as Jewish. Looked at from this point of view, for politics, economics, diplomacy, social care, and many such other elements of the workings of the state to be considered as authentically Jewish, they would have to positively, meaningfully correspond to what the historical conversation or argumentation would mark as Jewish. I must note that a Jewishly concerned point of view would most likely also question the idea of the modern sovereign nation state and may very well arrive at, arrive at the conclusion that a Jewish notion of ethics and the conduct of public life, according to Jewish pr uh, principles, is simply incommensurable with the political configuration of the modern nation state. In this regard, as in many others, while Halak's judgment that uh, traditional Islamic notions of governance, ethics, subjectivity, and law, among others, are so incompatible with the foundational notions of the sovereign modern nation state as to render the idea of uh, an Islamic state in this regard an impossibility in principle, is also highly informative to our discussion here. Nevertheless, in the context of the predominant discourse I am considering here, most references to Israel as being a Jewish state do not address this fundamental question. They seem to take as given the basic form of the politics of the nation state, and they dwell exclusively on the, questions of the, on the question of the contents that would make such a state authentically Jewish. We would be encouraged, in the context of this discourse, to ask questions such as, um, what Jewish principles would, <coughs> I'm sorry, should guide the conduct of the war, of the state? In what, stay, in what sense is the conduct of a Jewish military, and especially the waging of war by such a military, in what sense is it different from non-Jewish militaries? What is Jewish diplomacy, or what should it be? What are the contour, contours of uh, Jewish economy, and so on? <clears throat> 
More often than not, when these questions are posed, they are posed in a critical framing, where the speaker often presupposes the answer, they know what it should do, um, and goes on to criticize the state for failing to adhere to these values, suggesting that is that the state fails to adhere to its foundation or constitution as a Jewish state. Note also that in the case of the notion of the Jews state, it would seem that form alone is of relevance. As long as the configuration of power or political form of the nation state is seen as constructed by or for Jews, there is no point, or in some formulations it is nonsensical, if not even illegitimate, to ask questions of content, such as what is Jewish about the economy, about the diplomacy, about the social care, etc., of the state. From this point of view, whatever Jews do with their economy, with their army, with their diplomacy, with their social welfare, etc., is ipso facto Jewish. The Jewish state perspective, on the other hand, will focus primarily on content. It will expect the behavior of the state, regardless of the details of its configuration of power, to correspond to a certain aspect of the teachings that is Judaism. By way of example, let, let us consider two not, not unrepresentative examplars of these contesting views of Israel. The first comes from a study of the ideational infrastructure of the Islamic revolution in Iran. The author, uh, Hamid Abashi, ties the history of the 1979 revolution in Iran and the formation of the Islamic Republic into a regional and global history in which the idea of a Jewish state plays a crucial role. He maintains that in order to understand the events culminating in the establishment of the Islamic Republic, it is imperative to consider the geopolitics of the region, drawing a direct parallel between Iran's Islamic nature or constitution and Israel's Jewish nature. As he writes, and I'm quoting, you see the quote uh, on the wall here, the establishment of the state of Israel created the first modern Jewish state in the region in specifically religious terms. The first Arab-Israeli war turned the Palestinian problem into the cornerstone of regional conflicts and the Jewish nature of the state of Israel was bound to intensify the Islamic disposition of opposition to it. It is critically important to keep in mind that precisely at the time that both a Jewish state in Palestine and a Hindu-Muslim bifurcation in the Indian subcontinent was taking place, Iran was experiencing the most momentous part of its modern history. The gist of the argument is clear. Israel's Jewish identity refers to the same conceptual realm where Iran's Islamic revolution is to be found. It clearly has to do with a political configuration that nourishes on traditional religious normativity and not only a matter of the genealogy of those in whose name the state is sovereign. Compare, or rather contrast, this view with a rather straightforward explication of a secularist liberal Zionist proclamation. This was made by, the, by an editorial piece in Israel's Haaretz newspaper protesting against a governmental initiative to strengthen the Jewish identity of Israeli Jews. Zionism, the editorial proclaims, and I'm quoting, Zionism dreamt of a state for the Jews not a Jewish state, a refuge for members of the Jewish people, not a state with an official religion like Muslim Saudi Arabia. The Balfour Declaration promised a national home, not a religious one. On Israeli identity cards, Jewish describes a nationality that is not a religion, end of quote. The thrust of the argument here goes directly against Dabashi's comment uh, earlier regarding the parallels between Israel and Iran. Israel is not, it was never meant to be a Jewish state. It is only a state of Jews. Any normatively Jewish prescriptions for, prescription for the polity beyond this objective fact amounts to religious coercion, 
and uh, distortion of the state's found, uh, foundational principles. So as you see, there is a Jewish identity problem playing out here. Israel's Jewish identity problem can be understood as a direct outcome of the Zionist unresolved claim to Jewish identity. Zionism spearheaded a modernist secularizing shift that turned the focus away from the subjective, historical, and traditional matter of Judaism to the allegedly objective and predetermined matter of Jews. In this scheme, Jews are primarily identified by what they are, as it were. That is, their alleged natural, common biological origin, blood, ethnos, race, however you call it, and not, and only remotely, by what they believe, by what they practice, and by how they live their collective and individual lives, i.e. Judaism in its varied and even conflicting historical manifestations. Viewed as an enlightened secularization and politicization of Jews, of Judaism, and of Jewish identity, this ideological foundation of Zionism ultimately consolidated around a political nation state is trading, according to which the foremost redemptive modern reincarnation of Judaism itself is to be the nation state of Jews. Depicting two millennia of Jewish life outside of the framework of Jewish sovereignty as a pathology, this ideology insists that the nation statist politicization of Jews would also amount to their normalization, a healing of the Jewish collective body. Critically, this healing would mean that Jews are no longer unique, but rather normal, a nation like all other nations of the world. Among other things, this normalcy would mean, so the ideology has determined, <clears throat> that once this polity, the Jews state, comes into being, everything done in the framework of the state will be, by natural and obvious political definition, Jewish. Moreover, ideal, uh, I'm sorry, it would, it would make the state itself Jewish. To this day, Zionist ideologues repeatedly draw a comparison to other European nation states, suggesting that Jew should be read as exactly equivalent conceptually to French, Italian, German, and so forth. Just as the nation state of the French, France, is French simply by virtue of being their state, so the nation state of the Jews, Israel, is Jewish by virtue of its being their state. The people's being Jews, that is their natural makeup, makes their state, again, ipso facto, Jewish. In any event, the most immediate implication of this analogy, a nation like all other nations, given the historical context of the establishment of the state of Israel, has been the logic produced by the reversing of the analogy. Israel is Jewish only insofar as it is a state of Jews, where the population it rules over not to be seen as Jewish, the Jews state will cease to exist as such. Alternative potential understandings of Jewish nation statism, according to which it is the Jewish constitution of the state, whatever this notion may amount to, uh, to and I don't want to start in guessing, uh, that determines its Jewishness, regardless of the biological, racial, or ethnic origin of the members of its population, are simply not, con not considered viable. They are often assumed to imply that Israel would become a theocracy, hence rejected outright by a liberal, democratic, secularist mindset. Furthermore, it is important to remember that Israel's history is such that the nation state, itself the culmination of an ideological and uh, political project, preceded the formation of the state's nation. In actuality, the state itself has played a most central role in bringing Jews from all over the world under its sovereignty, and then shaping this newly created collective as new national Hebrews or Israelis. And just as crucially, that the territory over which the state is sovereign has been historically settled by non-Jews. <clears throat> 
These foundational parameters have determined a historical course by which the state is bound by its own guiding logic to manufacture, to maintain a Jewish majority, or to be precise, a majority of Jews, as it sees it, in its population. This necessitates the ceaseless arithmetic of demography, where a necessary majority of Jews is continuously counted against a minority of non-Jewish Palestinian Arabs, rendering the latter an immediate threat to the very notion of sovereignty of Jews. Yet most crucially, as I mentioned earlier, both the Zionist ideological foundation and its political embodiment, the State of Israel, have failed to offer their own modern, enlightened, secular, natural, etc., definition of Jewish identity. Instead, either as a stopgap or maybe as a somewhat of a self-defying, self-denying, almost Freudian slip-like uh, manifestation of adherence to a mythical, essentialist notion of Jewishness, the state, and this is done under the dominance of the socialist Zionist party in the formative decades of the state, I must mention, it has chosen to rely on rabbinical, orthodox gatekeepers for the foundational maintenance and upholding of the line separating Jews from non-Jews. Now, uh, the prevalent discourse in Israel blames this reality on the orthodox minority's alleged coercion of the non-orthodox majority, and it is indeed helpful for this majority's upholding of an in, uh, enlightened, liberal, democratic self-image, but uh, it should not distract us from seeing how important is the role of the rabbinical gatekeepers for the state's upholding of its most basic of premises, that it, that it is a Jew's state. The Israeli Jewish identity crisis is further compounded by another basic failure of the Zionist prognosis. Contrary to the secularist prediction that the nation state of the Jews would become not only the center of Jewish life, but also the very embodiment of modern Jewishness, rendering non-Israeli Jewish identity pathologically incomplete, if not outright inauthentic, Jews throughout the world, and Israeli Jews in particular, have kept on insisting, as has been historically the case, that Jewish origin alone does not suffice. Or, to put it politically, that a positively meaningful Jewish identification demands more than just being subjected to the sovereignty of the state of Jews. It needs to be Jewish. This, of course, is further emphasized by the fact that there are also non-Jews who are the subjects of the sovereignty. Contrary to the statist Zionist prognosis, Israeli political culture does not accept the designation of these people or their creations as Jewish simply by virtue of their being citizens of the Jewish state, sons and daughters of the land of Israel, and even speakers of Israeli Hebrew. It's not enough. Moreover, the political culture sponsored and propagated by the state itself through its various institutions and branches, echoes this normative understanding of Jewishness, even if it does so clumsily. This is manifested primarily in what has been historically called the status quo, and what recent secularist protestations decry as religionization, the making, the making of something religious. Namely, the propagation by the state of an admittedly narrow and problematic sense of Jewish identity mostly through the statist educational system and via the legal enforcement of certain um, decrees as a matter of civil, i.e. secular law, that color the Israeli public sphere in Jewish hues. These governmental measures, while far from instilling one's identity with a positive, positively meaningful knowledge of Jewish history, of Jewish tradition, of ethics and identity, have one fundamental trait. They are reserved for Jews alone. They reiterate the basic fault lines of Israeli nationhood. We may safely generalize and state that Israeli politics is determined by an uneasy upholding of both and at the same time an objective sense, 
that Israel is primarily a polity of Jews, an enormative notion that it is, or it should be, a Jewish polity. This combination is upheld regardless, or in spite of the fact, that as I hope uh, we all see now, these two outlooks may end up directing the polity in differing ways, in different ways, not infrequently conflicting with each other. And maybe more importantly, as I argued earlier, the tension entailed in this uneasy combination is often overlooked or outright denied. Well, there is much talk, sometimes it seems like an endless discussion, on matters pertaining to the politics of Jewish identity in Israel, often labeled under religion and politics in Israel. Much of this talk fails to address directly the tension between two different understandings or outlooks of Israel's Jewishness. Put schematically, we may say that while the state is founded as a matter of its political and ide ideational constitution on a political Zionist notion of a polity of Jews, important segments of the cultural and especially the educational sphere within the state have been shaped by a cultural Zionist notion of Jewish politics that importantly, both the state and the culture and the education it has promoted has been viewed as secular. So in other words, both the idea of an objective determinant of Jewishness and the subjective notion of Jewish culture are seen as independent, at least in principle, from religion. Yet the agreement seems to persist that much of the substance of Judaism as a culture, as well as the essence of a hereditary determinant of Jewishness, have been historically dominated by a religious tradition. This transforms the ascription of Jewishness and Jewish culture as secular into a self-professed revolutionary act. The tension entailed herein <clears throat> shapes much of the actions, debates, and analysis on matters uh, uh, of the matters at hand, I'm sorry. <clears throat> mm. So to briefly mention but one obvious example, recent obvious example, this tension is what lies at the basis of the legislation of a controversial nation state law and especially the continuous debate over it. This basic law, Israel, the nation state of the Jewish people, a quasi-constitutional legislation, that has been the focus of a continuous debate within Israel for over a decade, and since clearing the last legislative hurdles in July 2018, also attracted much international attention, is the culmination of a heightened political tension surrounding Israel's Jewish identity, which has come to, dominant, to dominate I'm sorry, <clears throat> Israeli politics in the past couple of decades. I would argue that a key way to understanding the history of this law and the law itself, which allegedly aims to enshrine Israel's identity as the Jewish state, is to read it as an initiative motivated by concerns of the state of Jews kind, meaning an attempt to reiterate or reinstate constitutionally the preferential status of the majority of Jews over Palestinian Arabs within the state, which was somewhat unintentionally transformed into an apparently confused debate over the meaning of a Jewish state, meaning an attempt to explicate what a normative adherence to Jewish heritage may amount to. The debate over the bill was, I'm sorry, has offered a clear view of the essential tension at the very roots of the Israeli politics. Specifically, it high, highlighted the tension between Zionism's rebellion against what it has viewed as Jewish religion and its, Zionism's, foundational claim to a Jewish history and to Jewish identity that, I, that are, by the Zionist own account, saturated with the same religious elements. More critically, it has exposed the Zionist inability to construct a full-fledged independent from religion, i.e. in Zionism's own terminology, national and secular, positively normative sense of Jewish identity. Such an ideological construction could have been the source that would clearly identify Israel's values as a Jewish state, hence ultimately the Israeli meaning of Jewish politics. Instead, 
the law direct, directs Matsovich's uh, impetus toward a negative construction of Jewish Zionist nationhood by way of refuting the Palestinian claims to nationhood and attempting to buttress the preference of Jews over non-Jews in Israel. Two issues <clears throat> emerged almost immediately as the flashpoints attracting most commentators' attention. The implied preference of Israel's Jewish identity over its liberal democratic principles, and the two, I'm sorry, when the two were understood to be in conflict, and the assertion of Jewish nationhood through the blunt negation of Palestinian nationhood. In the critical liberal oppositional, liberal Zionist oppositional reading of the law, a reading that, as we already saw above, is principally committed to a state of Jews framework, the main motive behind the law is an attempt which the critics clearly see as racist to firmly establish the collective inferiority of Palestinian Arabs in the nation state of the Jews. In this reading, which is already also I'm sorry, showing here, the internationally accepted rightful affirmation of the Jewish majority's determination of Israel's Jewish identity masks a more sinister, less acceptable practice of apartheid, as Haaretz called it in 2013, in which this affirmation is built primarily on the negation of the national other. The centrality of the Palestinian challenge to political Zionist nationhood is most clearly explicated in a draft proposal to the original legislative bill published by an Institute for Zionist Strategies in 2009, so almost a decade before the law passed uh, its uh, last hurdle. This document's authors justify the legislative initiative as a countermeasure to what they decry as a gradual erosion and ultimately a perversion of the Zionist vision entailed in the idea, which the document bemoans, it has clearly gained traction, that the preference of Jews over non-Jews in Israel is illegitimate. If left unopposed, they warn, this trend would lead to the transformation of Israel into the opposite of a state of the Jews, namely a state of all of its citizens. A liberal democratic state where all citizens, regardless of their nationalist belonging and aspirations, enjoy equal status, not only in the face of the law, but also in the allocation of material and symbolic resources. Doing so, they clearly expose the fundamental dependency of the state of Jews' outlook on an a priori demographic calculation of a privileged majority versus a tolerated minority. In this framework of nationalist political philosophy, the Jewish character of the nation state must amount to an explicit preference of people who are Jews over those who are not, at least in collective terms. The authors directly identified the liberal threat to the state of Jews, or to this outlook, as they warn against, and I'm quoting, radical liberal interpretation the elevation of equality to an exclusive supreme value in Israel that distorts the intention of the founding fathers of the state of Israel. It denies the Jewish people its right to self-determination and leads to the rapt conclusion that all laws contributing to the Jewish character of Israel are undemocratic, except for now they, uh, they, they add the law of return, and they must therefore be annulled." End of quote. As uh, Avi Dichter, who also quoted here, presented the bill to the Israeli parliament, has triumphantly put it, the basic law is aimed at preventing even a shadow of a thought, not to mention an attempt to transform Israel into a state of all of its citizens. Haaretz editorial highlighted the impetus of this assertion, and I'm quoting, the ugly naked truth has been exposed. The nation state law was meant to make it clear to Israeli Arabs that the state views them as second class citizens. Admittedly, they have equal rights, just like the rest of us, but they should know that the state doesn't belong to all its citizens. 
Moreover, since Israel is not a state of all of its citizens, any government that includes the Arab parties would undermine the security of the state and its citizens. End of quote from Haaretz. Other oppositions to the bill may also shed light on the matter at hand. Throughout the almost decade of debate over the bill, it has been insistently opposed by two groups who are usually considered to be on the sidelines of mainstream Israeli sociopolitics, Palestinian Arabs and ultra-Orthodox Jews. As for the former, the reasons for rejecting the bill are quite obvious. Palestinian Arabs object to a political configuration of power that puts them in a precarious position of a tolerated minority who lacks equal protection of its collective rights. Yet in the context of the current discussion, it is the ultra-Orthodox Jewish opposition to this bill that sheds light on what is at stake between the two readings of Jewish politics discussed this evening. This opposition may indeed seem perplexing. Wouldn't a reaffirmation of Israel's Jewish identity be something naturally favored by those who conservatively observe Jewish law? Yet the wider ultra-Orthodox discourse on the matter makes it clear that the opposition is not aimed at the law per se, but rather at the overall epistemology, I would say, from which it nourishes. Simply put, the ultra-Orthodox view rejects the very notion that Israel is a Jewish state, since in the ultra-Orthodox view, the Jewishness of the state must amount to more than the Zionist understanding of Jewish politics, that is mainly a state of Jews calculation of demographics or a demographic imbalance. The challenge here is not against the intended strengthening of Israel's Jewish character, but against the Zionist understanding or construction of this character. In other words, the ultra-Orthodox opposition suggests a critical Jewish state perspective or Jewish state view of the Israeli polity judging it to be fundamentally lacking exactly in being indifferent, if not outright hostile, to what the nationalist view designates as Jewish religion. And the ultra-Orthodox critique sees this religion as the very essence of Jewishness. Now, to conclude, for those who are concerned with the Jewishness of the state, the Jewishness of the state of the Jews, there seems to be only one viable course of action, a Jewish constructive critique of the current meaning and future outlook of Jewish politics. This critique must over, uh, overcome uh, a limited, narrow, and one-dimensional frame of reference which has come to dominate public discourse in which one is either pro-Israel and passively and reflectively accept the state's rendition of Jewish politics, or she or he is anti-Israel and adopting a, adopting a discourse that justifiably or not may very well end up being labeled anti-Jewish, hence excluded a priori from an intra-Jewish conversation. I would not pretend to suggest that I have the key to this solution. The task of searching for such a key must be a collective effort, I would say, and any attempt at approaching it must be put in a dialogue with competing and complementing ideas as have been the case one is tempted to note throughout Jewish history. It seems to be that whatever Jewish critique we may consider, it would have to begin with a refutation of the modern, racialized and nationalized arithmetic of a Jewish majority versus non-Jewish minority. Instead, it would be wise to reclaim a normative stand, stance, I'm sorry, or normative sense of Jewishness and of Judaism as those who guide the meaning of Jewish politics. It seems clear to me that the constitutive concept of Jewish collectivity has been the Jews' commitment to an ethic. This concept could indeed be seen as anathema to the politics of the modern nation state. As, and I'm quoting here a colleague, Brian Clark, the whole idea of Israel in the Torah is conditional conditional upon the people keeping their side of the bargain, living up to the billing as 
a light of nations. Thank you. David Ben-Gurion, 1946, wrote, we shall go to Palestine in order to become a majority there. If Palestine proves too small, her frontiers will have to be extended. A claim to enlarge by conquest of neighboring states. Does this help to explain the very militaristic nature of modern Israel? It's a very good question. Does the commitment to an arithmetic of a majority of Jews versus a minority of non-Jews drive militarism. I think in the history of Israel, unfortunately, the answer seems to be positive. Yeah, Israeli militarism has been um, a staple of its political culture. Critical uh, studies of Israel would tell you volumes about what <coughs> militarism as a, a pervasive concept, not just in the realm of militarism and politics, but also in education and culture and media and the construction of the subject even. Um, does to Israeli identity and the degree to which it determines so much of the policy. Um, I wouldn't want to jump into grand arguments that are pretty deterministic, saying that it would never end in a sense, if you know if, if the military or the of militarism has this impetus, does the politic always follow it? But I think it's, um, it's clear that the reliance on military power has been driven by such considerations, I would say, yes. When Ben-Gurion was going to establish the state of Israel, uh, or he wanted the Jewish national law in a state, he went to the British authorities, who then had the mandate, and which was the three-man team, uh, which was uh, interviewing him, Mm -hmm. He brought no papers, but he had a Bible on, on the table, you see. And the, uh, the chairman of the committee said, Mr. Ben-Gurion, have you got any evidence of the fact that you own this place? Can you show any uh, legal rights, uh, you know, some, some title deeds and things like that? Yeah. And he turned around and he said, well, the evidence is in that book. Now, which means that, I don't know whether you agree or disagree, uh, is there evidence in the, in the Bible to say that this land belongs to the Jewish people? Famously, the Bible is given to different readings and different interpretations. I think if you, give, if you read the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, in its own terms, it's clear that it's a story about a covenant and the upholding and the unholding or the breaking of the covenant. I mean, the Bible tells a story of relationship, a relationship between a people and its God, or a God and, its, and his or her people. And it tells a very straightforward narrative in which exile and the lack of sovereignty is a punishment by God, which has been the Jewish reading for generations, for two millennia. Uh, a colleague of mine, an Israeli historian, has captured the Ben-Gurionist or yeah, mainstream Zionist reading or even usage of the Bible in a brilliant slogan that captures this Israeli mindset saying there is no God and he promised us the land. <laughs> Which is the, and if you think of it, this is also, you know, you know, I grew up in Israel. This is how I basically was educated in a state school to uh, value the Bible, to read it as a constitutive document, but as a secular document. So the whole theological and ethical and covenantal element is, uh, I would say, dried out of it in a sense. Um, but this is not to say that my reading of it is better than anyone else's. I think, again, what Jewish tradition tells us that it's the discussion over, the debate over, that is the most Jewish element here and not the ideological determination of it which I would be suggested by you know, showing it as a legal proof. Really great lecture. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you much. so much. Um, I was just interested in the impact of pragmatism on the situation that you've described because, of course, now the United Arab List is in the governing coalition. Yes. And I'm interested in your thoughts around the tensions that that might now introduce and yes. the dilemmas that you're describing and suddenly, you know, yes. 
the excluded yes. minority are, are in some degree of power at least. Yes. Yes, thank you. It's a great question. I think, uh, yeah, pragmatism is the only way in which to explain what happened in Israel when this government, uh, this coalition, if, you, if people follow the news, they might know, a coalition of many small parties that have literally no um, political or ideological common denominator other than two. Actually, they have two. One is being the anti-Netanyahu group, which is highly important. Second, uh, if you follow it as well, in news, uh, um, a very critical appreciation of, modern, of, of ultra-Orthodox Jews, which is very interesting to see uh, playing out. Um, this pragmatism actually showed the Haaretz uh, quote that I read earlier from 2013 to be wrong. There is a Palestinian party in the Israeli government now, and um, its inclusion has been preceded by negotiation between Netanyahu and the, uh, and the party. So, I guess uh, the vast spectrum of Israeli political parties have already agreed to this notion of inclusion. Um, but I wouldn't be too optimistic that pragmatism can solve uh, everything. Uh, it's too, too precarious uh, a, a proposition, this coalition, to, you know, to see it as developing more than just, how would I say, uh, the preservation of common interests. So if you think of pragmatism as a well, how would I say, potential solution to conflicts or to the conflict or to a, some progress, um, I would be less optimistic about it. Another question at the back. Seeing the relatively modern and secular development of the Jewish national identity, what would it take for in the future to Arabs be considered a part of the Jewish nation? Thank you again. All, all wonderful questions and uh, deserving much more than the time would allow. But let me put it this way. Um, if you read some of the committed nation statist Zionist ideologues, such as, I'm, I'm sure many of you know the, uh, the, the famous Israeli author A.B. Yoshua, sometimes a, a world-renowned author, you read his essays on uh, Zionism, he says this in so many words. Ideally, ideally, we should be Israel is a Jewish state because Israel is the Jewish people, and anyone in the state ideally should be Jewish. Just like you don't consider a French Jewish author not French because he's Jewish, you wouldn't consider a Palestinian Israeli author not Jewish because he's Palestinian. But, goes on A.B. Yoshua, something sticks out. Something, uh, there's a stick in the, in the wheel. The stick, according to this view, is the conflict. So as long as, there, as, long there is, as long as there is a conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, and the identities are seen as enemies, the inclusion, according to this view, is an impossibility. I would say, even when the conflict is resolved, we would still have the issue of how do you square a Jewish history that reads Jewish identity in a certain way, and then this secularizing, modernizing, and in a sense, uh, politicizing to the degree of making just a statist identity of Judaism. Because I want just, I'm sorry, just one, uh, one addition. There's a mirror image to your question. What happens to non-Israeli Jews? So A.B. Yoshua, again, I don't want to make this lecture about him. I wrote a chapter on him if you read my, one of my books. <laughs> Uh, Abi Yoshua likes to go around in the world and say to his audience, 90% of which are Jewish in America and in England, and tell them, you are not complete. I am a complete Jew, you are missing Jews. Why? Because I am part of a Jewish polity. So when I, when I uh, pave a road, I pave a Jewish road. When you pave a road, you pave a road, in Amer it's an American road. Right, so the action itself, and this is also a very Ben Gurionist uh, understanding of Jewish identity. I don't think either of these problems is going to just disappear. That Palestinians are going to become Jewish, or non-Jewish, uh, non-Israeli Jews will just give up on their Jewish identity and say, yeah, uh, we we are, how would I say, depositing our identity in Israel. Um, a Jewish friend of mine told me, has told me that um, non-Orthodox Jews regard the higher uh, birth rate of Orthodox Jews as a long-term threat to the character of Israel. 
Do you think that's true? And if so, what is the fact? I think it's half true. It's true that in the context of a perceived culture war between Jewish groups within Israel, a secular majority perceives itself to be under threat from a growing ultra-Orthodox minority, no doubt. Why is it half true? Because when you expand the picture, when you consider the demographic of Israel, you would often hear secular spokespeople saying, thank God for the ultra-Orthodox rate of reproduction because they keep the balance, or the imbalance, I'm sorry. They keep the, imp the, the, the lack of parity between Jews and Palestinians. Because also among Palestinians, there's a relatively higher uh, birth rate than among uh, you know, middle class Israeli seculars. Um, it's clear, and again, maybe this goes back to my answer regarding uh, the, the current coalition. It's clear that this tension between ultra-Orthodox communities within Israel and other communities is growing to be the determining feature of Israeli, internal Jewish Israeli politics. But like so many other things, it's always overshadowed by the conflict with a capital T and a capital C. Professor Yekdar, thank you very much, thank you so for, much your, for, uh, for your lecture. Thanks.